you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in a couple different passages this morning. I want to start here, Acts 16, starting in verse 19, will also be in John 16. But Acts 16, verse 19, but when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. When they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews, And they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore their garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stalks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everybody's bonds were unfastened. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. We know your presence is here. I just ask that you would come even more. Speak into our hearts. May it be your message and not mine. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts find acceptance in you. We love you. We trust you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I am so excited to be here. Let's, uh, let's start with the name. Let's get that out of the way. John Wayne McMahon. I was told long ago about this awful bet that dad had in college. That whoever had the first son out of the group was going to name him Miriam. That's John Wayne's real name. And word is dad lost the bet. And mom said, no, that won't happen. So they settled on John Wayne, and I embrace it, because it could have been worse. It's been a rough childhood. As Patrick mentioned, I am the Director of Youth and Young Adult Ministries at First United Methodist in Bryan. Uh, Rick Sitton was my first senior pastor to, to hire me on in that job, and I've been very blessed. And I was at camp with Patrick this week, and we have... Plenty of stories. We were co-directors for 175 8th and 9th graders. It was, a, it was a week. There's a couple other counselors that are here with us. They can testify to that. Um, I just graduated. I just want to tell you a little bit about myself so you don't think I'm some stranger that wandered in here and Patrick said, go ahead, I'm tired. <laughs> I graduated from Sam Houston State University last December after seven long years of undergrad. If there are any youth or parents in the room and you need some advice on what not to do, come see me after church. We will talk about it. Uh, I transferred, graduated with like 190 hours. It was, it was fun times. Um, I'm an economics major. Get this. There was a time when I thought I was going to be a wealthy businessman, and then uh, you know, we, we talked. And then God came and knocking, and um, here I am. This fall, I go to Asbury Um, where Patrick got his Master's in Divinity. I'm very excited. I got accepted for a scholarship program to be a church planter. I know, I'm crazy, but I somehow I thought God was calling me to plant a church, so we're headed that direction. April 5th of next year, I get to marry this beautiful young woman right here, Lauren. I point her out because she makes me look a whole lot better. I keep, he said, he said it well in Sunday school. He said, most guys marry up. He married out of his species, and so yeah. (laughs) Yes, correct. And as mentioned, Patsy Edmiston is my aunt, and uh, if many of you know them, Charlie was one of our favorite uncles, and many stories have taken a snipe hunting out on the golf course, um, but that's another, another topic. So let's get started. Have you seen Apollo 13? Yeah? Come on. Really? Tom Hanks? Yeah? One of my favorite movies, and Tom Hanks is one of my favorite actors, and uh, just to give you a little background on the movie, so uh, the movie opens, and Jim Lovell, who is played by Tom Hanks, is hosting 
a, a watch party at their house to watch um, Neil Armstrong and Apollo 11 walk on the moon. And in that moment, Tom Hanks or Jim Lovell says, I'm going I'm to go to the moon. And so he was supposed to be on Apollo 14, um, but he gets the call that him and his crew are going to go on Apollo 13 and go to the moon. And so he begins training, and what he spent his life for is to be able to land on the moon. Um, and so they finally get to the day when they take off, and since, uh, since they had already been to the moon on an earlier, earlier mission, network TVs didn't really care about showing anything, like that's old news. And so they do a live feed from the spaceship, and nobody really sees it until they're a few days into their mission. Um, Sw- Swag, I can't even remember his name, but Kevin Bacon is sitting in the seat, and he has to stir the tanks, and he hits the button, and poof, they lose most of their oxygen and power when they're not even close to the moon, still headed that way. And immediately you can see the danger in that. And so we go to that moment, now all network TV is watching, right? Now we care. And um, it shows Jim Lovell's wife at home with another watch party, this one with a different mood. And they're watching the TV and they're following. And they show an earlier interview of Jim Lovell when the interviewer asked him, have you ever been afraid while flying an aircraft? Have you ever had that fear? And he says, well, a few. Engines caught fire and he... And, the interviewer asks, have you ever had a specific situation that you could share? And Lovell says, yeah, sure, I was flying this banshee. I was in combat, so there were no running lights. And he lost his radar and had nowhere, didn't know where he was going. And so he tried to turn some lights on and look at the map, and there was a short, and he lost all lights in his plane. And all he could see was the black ocean below him. And he was considering ditching and, and abandoning the ship and... and and landing in that black ocean to try and make his way that way. And when he looked down, he saw this green path, the kind that's turned up from a big ship, the carrier that he's looking for. He said it was like a green carpet laid out before him, showing his way home. That moment, he says this, that you never know what events will transpire to get you home. And so from there, we see the hope that is in Lovell all the way through the rest of the movie that's actually very historical to what actually happened. And so I share this with you because the passage we're talking about this morning has to do with hope. A hope that surpasses understanding. I wanted to teach on this passage because it's been heavy on my heart. See, recently y'all hosted UM Army, right? They came and stayed in your church. And recently I took my youth group to do UM Army as well in Baytown. And I had the privilege of preaching that week um, and we were learning about what it was to be authentic witness. And I remember one night in particular talking about this stuff, about being a hopeful witness. And after that message, it became very obvious to me that there were so many that really couldn't find hope. That didn't know what it was to have that hope in the midst of darkness. Kids shared with me all kinds of stuff. For example, one kid shared his struggle to be there with his sister who was recently sexually assaulted. Another talked of extensive bullying even within his youth group. To not even be accepted in the group, this community of faith. Another talked to me about the aftermath of being sexually abused by his father. I even spoke to adults in the midst of tragedy. We're there for the kids, but you know God's moving in everybody there. A father who just lost his daughter to cancer and also his wife turning away from the faith and struggling with knowing that God is there for that. And still another heavily burdened by finances. I know there's some in uh, in here that can probably um, relate to some of these, right? The theme verse that week came from 1 Peter 3.15 and it says this, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. And I started to realize, how do I respond to these people? It's not that they need to prepare on how to respond, it's that they don't know if there is hope. Well, in 1 Peter, Peter is writing to people struggling through tough times and persecution. It is important to note that Peter is not telling these people to buck up, get over it. 
Stop pouting. It's not that bad. That's not what he's saying here. He's reminding them that we have a hope in Jesus Christ that surpasses understanding. And we have to stand in the middle of our circumstances and tell people about that joy, about that hope, and why we have it. I'm reminded of a pastor that I follow. He has a church in Dallas. He shared a story of one of his members. This member tweeted out something that was polarizing. It was an oxymoron. What he shared had two statements that just shouldn't go together. I know I probably lost a lot of you at the beginning of that when I said tweet. It's a social network thing, kind of like Facebook, and it doesn't matter. He shared this statement with the world that said this, My daughter has cancer. God is good. What? How, how can that be in the same sentence? That's almost offensive. The person outside looking in might want to shake that dad a little violently, right? Like, what are you talking about? How does someone have that kind of hope? This morning, I want to talk about the hope that we have in Christ that surpasses understanding. Now, to lay out my sermon, I do not want to pretend that we're all on the same page. I do not want to pretend that we all have this hope and just need to prepare to share it. Peter suge- as Peter suggests, as we walk through scriptures this morning, I want to talk about where this hope comes from and what it looks like to have this hope, and then finally, how do we share this hope with others? Y'all ready? That was the intro. I better get rolling, huh? Especially if we're going to beat the Baptist to lunch. That'd be a bad first impression. John Wayne, great name, but he kept this like 20 minutes after. Where does this hope come from? Let's look at John 16, and let me paint a little picture for the sake of time. Jesus makes this statement in John 16, 16. And most of this passage, I can follow along with the disciples. I can relate to them. I get them. So let's, let's look at this. In a little while, you won't see me anymore, but a little while after that, You'll see me again. And so like a lot of times when Jesus is teaching the disciples, they're confused and they're like, what? You're not going to see me? What, what are we talking about, Houdini? Like, what is this? Jesus is sensing their questions here. When you read the Bible and he answers thoughts and senses questions, hello. He answers their, their thoughts like he is so good at. And he begins to explain this statement in verse 22. He says, so You have sorrow now. I need us to hear this. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then you will rejoice, and no one can rob you of that joy. That's an important statement for us this morning. Then Jesus continues on, even saying that he'll speak plainly instead of figuratively. Disciples are like, thank goodness, finally. After he finishes, the disciples say, Add this to your list of things not to say to the Son of God. At last, you're speaking plainly. From this that you have said, we believe that you came from God. Okay, this is the end, towards the end of Jesus' ministry. Probably not good for the disciples, the one that have been following along, to say now. Okay, now we believe you're from God. You could sense the frustration. Jesus is like, really, now you believe the healing and the feeding the 5,000 and bringing people from um, um, death to life, that wasn't good enough for you? That's probably how I reacted or shaken someone violently. That's the second time I've said that. My heart's dark. God's working on me. Y'all bear with me. A week with 8th and ninth graders will do that to you. <laughs> but Jesus stays with this because he's Jesus. Do you finally believe? Like, But the time is coming, this is what he says, but the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when you will all be scattered. Each one is going his own way, leaving me alone, yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I have told you all this, so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. What do we do with this passage? First, we have to note that even Jesus Christ takes comfort in the Father being with him. 
even when everyone else leaves and scatters and leaves him alone. We are to find peace in Christ. Take heart, for I have overcome the world. That statement alone from hearing it doesn't cause us to muster up peace and muster up strength and courage to go on to have hope. It is only when we understand that Jesus Christ lived the life that we couldn't and died the death that we deserved for us. For us. To pay the debt that we couldn't. And the spirit that raised him from the dead now lives in us. And that spirit, and he has overcome the world. And that's where we find our hope. That's where our hope comes from. Now, we take heart. We have hope because he is with us and he has overcome the world. Yes, in this world, like he says, we will have trials and sorrows, but it is only because it is only being in Christ and the Father being with us. It's only in that being bigger than us being in the world that we have hope. I want to say that again. Get your heads around it today, church. That's heavy. We are in this world, and God said this world is good, but it is only when Christ being in us and us in Christ is bigger than us being in the world will we have hope. Because there are trials and there are sorrows. I think this is a powerful message for this church today. I'm reading through the prayer concerns and, and celebrating the life of a, another member today, and, and I, I just know that there's hurting. I know that there's hurting, and this is big for us. Now we get to our passages. Paul is someone that throughout everything knew that God was with him and knew that no matter what, they had to be Paul's focus. See, Paul from the New Testament is freer than anybody you're going to find. Paul, we're going to arrest you. Great, I'll convert your, your prison guards and everybody there. Well, Paul, we're going to kill you. Great, I get to be with my Savior even sooner. Paul will set you free. Well, more time to share his glory. Paul, we're going to beat you. Great, I'll just partake in the sufferings of Christ in his name. He's free because he knows that God's with him. And we see that in Acts 16. To give you a little background here, Paul and Silas are in Philippi. And they're there teaching and sharing God's message. And they walk by, every day they walk by this same demon-possessed woman on the, on the streets. And every day she screams at them. Screams at them. Oh, they're from God and they're trying to save you. Screams at them every day. And really, Scripture says, finally, Paul's exasperated from this. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. He just gets irritated and, and calls this demon out. And I love that because he didn't pray that Christ would do it, but he had the authority of Christ in him. He said, in the name of Jesus, come out. And so the people that own this slave are mad because they were making money off of her. They're irritated. And so they grab up Paul and Silas, and that's where we catch up with ours, with our, our story this morning. And they drag them in front of the city officials, and they say, these, these Jews, they ruin things for us. They're trouble. They're causing trouble in the city. And so they strip them naked, take their clothes, and beat them with rods, and then throw them in prison. And some commentaries and theologians say that the inner prison it speaks of talks about them being into sewage, maybe up to their waist or more. Man, bad day. That's, that takes the cake, right? You know that feeling when something happens and you're just like, you've got to be kidding me? This morning I was leaving Patsy's Lake House and the doorknob's weird, and they already warned us all about this. The doorknob's weird. If you walk, you know when doors are locked, you're not supposed to be able to turn it? Well, not hers. And so it's locked, and so I open it and go out to get something for my truck at 6 a.m. while everyone's asleep and close the door, and I'm locked out. <laughs> that feeling, like when you get a flat tire, that feeling, multiply that times 100. Any store, bad day you've had, let's look at Paul here, right? Or Jim Lovell not coming back from space. That's what Paul's up to sewage to hear. And here's our passage that we pick up. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Really, Paul? 
You're going to sing now? I don't think I, I couldn't sing a, pray, a song of joy at the end of most of our days at church camp this week. You're going to sing now, Paul? Really? How real is that for us today? That in whatever we're facing, sometimes we feel so overwhelmed and we feel like sewage is up to here. If we have this hope that Jesus is with us, He lives with us, then we can sing a song of praise and we can have joy in our heart. I love this message. Well, God showed up and He shook the prison foundation. The chains were broken off. And Paul ends up um, introducing Christ to the jailer and baptizing his entire family. And God showed up there, and a church is born in Philippi. And so we fast forward 10 to 12 years later to the book of Philippians. And guess where Paul is? He's in jail. And he's writing to this church in Philippi because they heard he was in jail and sent a gift. They've been supporting him in his ministry. And the whole letter you see Paul just being positive. I just, I think about that, I'm like, really? Your situation hasn't improved very much, Paul. It should be noted, I don't think he's in sewage, and, I, and he has his clothes, I think. Philippians 4.4, 4, he says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Where does that hope come from? That 10 to 12 years later, his situation has not improved very much, and he's telling these people, rejoice. And in case you didn't get it the first time, I say, rejoice. What would it be for this congregation or these people of Crockett to walk in the midst of sorrow and have joy in their heart because Jesus Christ lives in them? People would have to take notice, right? Man, sorry, I get excited. I want to end with this idea. How do we share this hope? What do we do? And what does it look like? Verse 25 of our story says this. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. In the midst of your troubles, in the midst of illness, in the midst of financial crisis, in the midst of abuse and broken homes, if you walk with the joy of the Lord in your heart, if you have a song of praise on your lips, people will take notice. They will see this. And that's our calling, is that the world would know that He lives in us. He's with me. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's with me. He's with me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this message this morning. That no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, we have hope in you. We know the ending. We know that you win. I pray that everyone here knows that they're a child of God. They can confidently approach the throne of grace. And if there is anyone here this morning that does not know you or does not know this hope, I, I pray they turn to you I pray they know your presence this morning. Thank you for Jesus and what his life, death, and resurrection means for us that there wasn't a way and you made a way through him. We love you and we trust you. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.